Our greatest successes in life are often found in helping others succeed. Welcome to the Life Masters Podcast, hosted by Tanya Memi. Discover real-life stories from mentors, leaders, experts, and everyday people who devote their lives to helping others succeed. Every episode takes you on a unique journey, an emotional experience, and tells a story never to be forgotten. Tune in to Life Masters with Tanya Memi and start fast-tracking your journey to success today. Hi, welcome to Life Masters. So today on the show, we have Rob Mack, and Rob is a happiness coach. He's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I am just honored to have you here today because everything that you teach and everything that I've heard you say uh, to, to, you know, to me and to your clients. And I mean, you're just, you're really, really exceptional. So I thank am, you for coming. I am. I don't know. No. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> I appreciate true. you saying that. I fully receive that. And, um, I would say that most of my life, I didn't feel that way though. Most of my life, I didn't I feel very exceptional or very extraordinary. I want to know, um, on that topic exactly yeah. is like, how did you, you said that, I mean, we're just going to go right into Let's it. Right? Dive right you, in, yeah. yeah. So you got started I mean, you started off on a really uh, down, how you got involved oh, with yeah. becoming a happiness coach. Like I was you... suicidal. Okay, I was I'm glad that you said suicidal. it, because I just didn't, yes. uh, yeah, it's hard, yeah. it's hard to, you know, bring Say the topic it. up. Yeah. But yeah, so like, t tell me about that, if you're willing to talk about yeah. it. Yeah, then... um, it was the worst thing that ever happened that right. turned into the best thing that ever happened. Um, and how old were you? I, I, I remember being deeply miserable and un unhappy since, as long as I've been living. I mean, honestly, since probably, I feel like birth. But I can remember clearly at six or seven feeling like life sucks. <laughs> but where does that come from? Does it come from your upbringing? Does it come from your yeah. environment? Or is it just... Yeah. I mean, I think I'm an empath. I think you're an empath. Yeah. And you pick up the energy of the folks around you mm -hmm. when they're very stressed and anxious and sad. And you pick it up from the world. You can feel it. Um, so it was that. It was largely that. Did you have a really tough upbringing? I did. Were... Yeah. Okay. My parents were phenomenal. I had a phenomenal family. But there was lots of stress and lots of conflict. And right. You know, and lots of, um, it was, I was really determined and destined to be successful and committed to being and doing things right. Perfectly, right. in fact. Which, yeah. which sometimes when they say you strive for perfection, it can actually, you know, it, yes. it's, it's not always healthy to always strive for perfection. That's right. No one's ever perfect. That's but, right. Exactly. Right. So you're always going to be disappointed, yes. first of all. That's exactly right. Because nothing can live up to the expectation that you've placed on yourself or you've placed on that thing. Wow. You know? Okay. Yeah. So you had so you had kind of an interesting um, upbringing. Where where did you say that you were from? Uh, little, little Washington, outside okay. of Pittsburgh. Nice. Yeah. So okay. very small little cow town. Wow. Yeah. And so like, what was it like for you in your life? You're six or seven year old. You're trying to be perfect. Yeah. You're very, you know, you just don't see the glass half full. I mean, what is that like for a kid? Like, and then how yeah. did it progress? Yeah. Um. So it was mostly me crying about something, probably okay. <laughs> trying to hide the tears. <laughs> And um, it was mostly me also just trying to hide myself. I was, I loved my own alone. Like I loved being alone because as much as I, maybe I was stuck with my own thoughts, it was better than being surrounded by people who I felt were always putting me on the spot to be or do something. Mm -hmm. I didn't like being social. I wasn't good at being social. I don't think I really even spoke too many words until I was like 13. I remember going to church and other people would ask my mom, Hey, does, does he not speak? And she said, oh, he'll speak when he's, when he's ready. He's, mm -hmm. he's probably just observing you or whatever. But I didn't um, socialize at all. And these thoughts that were mostly and largely unconscious for me at six or seven, you know, mm -hmm. you're not that aware of your self-talk, over time just got worse. And then it wasn't just about the stress and anxiety that surrounded me and that was sort of that I felt on the inside. It was also this existential angst that began to develop where I looked at life as a whole. And I was always very good at playing things out to the end. Like, so, mm -hmm. um, and I would say, okay, if I accomplish X or Y or Z, then what happens? Oh, wait, then I've got to do this, you know, climb this other mountain, this other mountain. Then what happens? Oh, well, death happens. And I was just, oh, wow. No matter what I accomplish on this planet or acquire, no matter what I do, I will die. And everyone I love will also die. And that is really, yeah. really morbid for such a young yeah. person, too. Yeah. Wow. So that's how you sort of saw the world. Oh, for sure. It was and then, just death, really. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is great. Wow. Yeah. That's what but it's, this yeah. is what makes you amazing today, how you can relate to all, your, all of your clients. It's mm. what's, what's brought you. Mm. You have been through so much that so you're so relatable. But um, so what was it like during that time that like what, what, what was it like days before yeah. you were about to take your life? Um, 
uh, it was no different than any other day. No, just not really. I was like, this sucks, and I hate my job. Did and you plan I, it? Did you um, like? I thought about writing a suicide note. Okay. I can contemplate that a couple of times, and then I just discovered I didn't know what to say. <laughs> What right. do you say? And I had tried to have this conversation in like bite-sized pieces with people I cared about very much, my family, and they were always great, but there was no way they could understand. Unless you've been there, you can't, it's impossible to, you know, and they would say, oh, just don't think that way. And I was like, but that's life. Like I'm sitting here right now with you. Mm -hmm. My 16, 7 year old self would have said, my gosh, this beautiful woman who I, maybe if I, even if I had just met you, she could be gone and five seconds. She could be gone in five days or five years, but in any case, she's going to be gone. Yeah, you don't know. Wow. So, yeah, just, so the days before, mm -hmm. nothing different, really. Um, and I can't say that I was 100% committed, obviously, obviously, if I was, I would not be here today. Right. Right. But um, I just started thinking and researching ways to do it. That's where my mind was at. Oh, I'll, yeah, I could take pills. I could shoot myself. You know, you start going down this rabbit hole of things that you could do. I didn't want to experience a whole lot of pain. I didn't want it to be that messy. I didn't want to like, the whole thing. But then you also realize you only have access to certain tools and things. So Yeah, it's interesting because in my life I've had, um, I know f three people that have committed suicide and one that attempted it and two of them were related to me. So mm. I understand and I, and I, I don't understand, but I'm, I've been through it too. So, but this is what makes you so relatable as a coach is that you have been through all of that mm. and that uh, right now suicide, you know, is at an all time high. So I'm yeah. sure that you can um, really relate to your clients and then I mean, how on earth did that change from yeah. that to yeah. becoming a happiness yeah, coach? Like, wild, let's huh? talk about that. It's wild, actually. And that's why I really do believe all of life is just this perf perfectly woven tapestry. Yeah. Um, you know, and so what happened with me is as I dug the steak knife in my wrist. Yeah. Wow. I, I just oh was because I was a pain thing. You know, you want to yeah. see how painful it's going to be. And um, I felt more peaceful and blissful than I'd ever felt before in my whole life. For no good reason, there's a knife in my arm. Wow, I cannot, I, I just, I can't really relate to that. Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so I had this experience and I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. I'm not, I'm feeling, nothing objectively has changed. I had a good job, I had a good family, I was healthy. I didn't have any real complaints. Yeah. Which actually made the depression a lot worse in some ways because I felt guilty for not being more grateful. Right. So. Well, it's very complicated. Yeah, yeah. it's a little complicated. As it would be, yeah. yeah. Um, but then I thought, when I had this experience of like peace, I thought I could postpone this for a day or at least an hour. <laughs> right. I should like maybe just right. do a little bit of searching. And so I did. I just started searching and researching a little bit and seeing what was going on within me. And I discovered that what was going with, on within me was a perfect microcosm for what was going on in the world at large. Like I was experiencing objectively good circumstances and a good life, but subjectively I felt like crap. Also in the world since 1950, there's been an increasing amount of suicides and depression. Yes. We've got 10 times the level of bipolar depression. You know, we've got more uh, access to uh, disorders. Um, we've got more stress, more anxiety. We've got more drug use in lots of ways. And it all points back to the same thing. This is all despite all the technological advances, the improvement in health, the improvement in quality of life, longer lives. I mean, all this objective stuff is improving, but subjectively we're feeling worse for it. So we are actually much happier in 1950 than we are today. I mean, I see it every day, too. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's apparent now, too. And they're also saying that, you know, drug with with all four cases that I've been aware of, they've all been on pain. They started off with on, on prescription drugs and blah, blah, blah. That's a whole other topic. Yeah. But what I love about you and what you so bring to this world and to your clients and to the people that you heal is that you have this experience. And because you come from that you can really, really help people through the toughest and most difficult times of their life. Yeah. And um, even for somebody like me, I've not committed or, or thought about, you know, contemplating suicide, but I have my, I've had my moments where mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, it might've been a brief thought because life is tough and life is hard. And, and I, I, you know, went through really difficult, a really difficult time recently. And um, so when I heard you talk about you being a happiness coach and the 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 in your inspiration pod that I heard you record already. I mean, you have so much amazing, incredible knowledge that um, I've never heard anybody eloquently say it the way that that you have. And everybody can relate to what you do and how you help people. And um, what I want to know is like, I so tell appreciate me, a, that. yes, I mean, that, it's that true. Means everything to me. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you for being on this planet. Yeah. And also tell me about a, uh, a success story of one of your clients. Like yeah. I want to know. Um, hmm. It's a great question. Um, so many, I mean, so but, many, yeah, right? well, yeah. And, um, and I say that not in a way that, um, gives credit to me. Yeah. Uh, Cause at my best, what I do best at my best is get out of the way. <laughs> okay. Right. I get out of the way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I've got, there's one particular client I remember, um, great kid. He was probably 17 or 18 and you work with a lot of teens. Hmm? Um, some, some. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say that, yeah, I definitely work with some teens. Um, and usually their parents call and the kids don't really of want course. to involved, yeah. you know, so that's how it goes. Um, and so there's a lot of like negotiation that goes on, but in any case, uh, yes. And so this kid, 17, 18, a great kid, you know, and he had, uh, he grew up, um, really, really fortunate and his parents had worked very, very hard to get them to a place where they could, he wouldn't have to worry about basic needs. He wouldn't have to worry about money really, you know, and they, they killed themselves in you know, in, in, uh, in doing that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this kid's a great kid, but, um, you know, he lied a lot, drug, lots of drug use, you know, not particularly happy. And, um, my work was basically to live with him. I live with this kid, you know, and I live with his family it was not, not painful. It was a beautiful house and a beautiful place. You mean you moved in? I moved in to help. And I don't family. often do this. Yeah. Wow. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. I moved oh my in. gosh. Yeah. It was a 24 hour a day thing. So I moved in with him and, uh, you know, and, the challenges, of course, is that the things that you and I could talk about, I couldn't necessarily talk to this kid about. I couldn't right. say, hey, this is why you should be happy and this is why you should not lie. And this is, it's not, the kid doesn't not register. Like yeah. yeah. So this is why I say at my best, I get out of the way. My job in a situation like that is simply to offer him the one thing that he's not able to access for himself, which essentially at the end of the day for all of us is really just unconditional love. You know, and his but parents, the parents thought that they were giving him and they were love, right? And, and and they and they very much were. He wasn't giving that to himself or allowing himself to access mm, that. Interesting, right? And and his parents and like all of us, they're busy. They got their own lives and they have things going on. They're trying to you know support and provide for the family. And so my job, the way I see it with all my clients, is to just provide a space of unconditional love and regard, so that they can hear their own wisdom, and so they can come up with their own answers, and so they can realize their own power, and. I often, in the beginning of my practice, I was doing a great disservice to clients because I was giving them all this information and all this stuff that I had learned over the years. And I realized that in lots of ways, that was a disservice because I was encouraging them and training them to lean on me and depend on me oh, right, for their, for their happiness. happiness. Whoa, and that's, yeah. Yeah, so. See um, that. Yeah, so the most transformative element in any therapy or coaching practice scientifically is unconditional regard. You know, so all therapists, ther therapies, all coaching uh, approaches pretty much work equally well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only matter, the, the only element that truly matters is how unconditionally loving or how much unconditional regard the therapist or coach can embody. Right. And have them come up with the yeah. answers. Yeah. So that it's unconditional from their side. That's too, exactly not right. Not just your side. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So, they can, so they can offer that to themselves. Okay. With this particular kid, that's all I focused on, even though we talked about things every now and then. How long did whatnot. you live with his family? Like three months. Wow, that's, yeah. that's a long it time. Was long, it was long for me because I like my alone. And you probably, <laughs> this, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You probably learned a lot though too. I did, but, absolutely. Yeah. And so end of story, um, I just, I do my best to let go of results. The results are up to me. I just focus on the process. Mm -hmm. Who knows, maybe the kid turned out better, maybe he didn't, but I gave it everything I had. And uh, I promise you like probably a month or two after, um, his parents wrote to me and said, Rob, my our son is completely transformed at a soul level oh i love that yeah and i that was and for me i'm like it was humbling and i don't say that no it was truly because i didn't i didn't do anything you know what i mean i, I genuinely didn't do anything you're I was so just humble a though you're one of the most humble people i've ever met and you you do change people you affect people when you walk into a room mm -hmm. rob you're like you really are one of those people and um but one of the things, too, that I love is that everything is scientifically based. You've spent many years studying uh, what happiness is and the science behind it, too. So when you speak, I love knowing that it's not only just coming from what you've learned, but it's also scientifically based. Ah, uh, yeah. These are not guesses. I have right. no guesses. I right. offer people no guesses. People have enough guesses of their own. Mm -hmm. Everything that I offer, and that's something I made a commitment to, everything I offer people is something that I have lived myself. If I haven't lived myself, I do not offer it up mm -hmm. as a suggestion or recommendation or advice. 
I don't because I, I, I received too much of that in my life. Everybody was telling me to do X, Y, or Z. And so many of them were wrong. And so many of them hadn't lived it. And then I would try it and I'd fail and I'd be the guinea pig. Mm-hmm. So I do not do that. I do not offer guesses. Everything that I offer people is tried and true based on science, often thousands of studies, and my personal um, experience on top of that. There are no guesses here at all. Very interesting. Yeah. So I know that we live in a very different society, even as we did like 10 years ago or even five years ago. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's catapulting quite quickly into it's changing every day very quickly. But I noticed that, you know, there's a lot of people, including myself, I have my moments where, you know, they're unhappy. They have their moments. What is the one thing do you think um, that causes yeah. unhappiness in a hum- in a person? Yeah, there's only one thing. And it's a great, great question. Uh, it's an over analytical mind. It's a mind that cannot stop thinking. It is the only source of unhappiness in the entire planet. It, <sighs> I yeah. just need to take a deep breath. Yeah, Woo, yeah that's there, there so is no, true. There is nothing more than that. Now look, that doesn't mean we don't experience physical pain. Physical pain is different. We're talking about mental, psychological, emotional, mm-hmm. and spiritual fear. suffering. There's so much fear. There's so much fear. Yeah. And fear know? is just a thought. It's just a thought. The yeah. worst thing that can happen to you in life or on your deathbed is a belief. It's just a thought. Yeah. You know, do we know that death is bad? Not at all. In fact, most spiritual traditions will tell you it's the greatest moment of your life. It's graduation. It's pure bliss. So we've got these beliefs and these ideas about life, about the condition, about the circumstance. And those ideas and beliefs lead us to feel a certain way. That's it. It's just a belief. And so that unhappiness to a large extent is an illusion. It's not that you're not experiencing it. But the same way that you have a dream, and in that dream you Mm -hmm. imagine you're suffering, okay, because you don't have enough food or somebody's mistreating you. And then you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh no, and then you realize it was a dream and you feel instantly better. Same thing that happens with our thoughts all the time. All the time. Right. Why is it at night too that uh, people's, why is it at night where everything just seems so like, uh, just everything's so tense at night and then you wake up in the morning and you're like, you just don't feel quite as intense. It's awareness because during the day you're distracted and entertained with so many different things and people that it's drowning out the noise. It's kind of like, have you ever been in a barber shop or a salon, maybe the old school ones, they'd have a fan blowing, but it was so much so loud, people were talking and stuff like, you just felt kind of anxious, but not that anxious. But you don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. <clears throat> yes. And maybe if you were the last person out the door and everyone that was real quiet, you heard that fan, it was so super loud. Like, why is that <laughs> fan blaring or the radio blaring? Just that. Wow, very, very, very interesting. Well, listen, I have, I have a million more questions uh, I want to ask you, but I do... Uh, you have to hear Rob's inspiration pod because I've never heard any, I really have never heard anything like that before. Mm-hmm. You have it ri- just just so perfectly said in a, in a short period of time and so much knowledge, so much wisdom. And uh, thank you so much for sharing it. So if you love Rob as much as we do, make sure that you uh, check out his inspiration pod. I promise you, you're going to want to listen to it again and again and again. You have just listened to another inspiring episode of Life Masters with Tanya Memi. To access the show notes for this episode or to listen to more shows, simply visit www.tanyamemi.com. Master your own life and be inspired to help others to succeed. Join us again next time here on Life Masters.